Um, okay, so the next uh, part of the workflow is now that we call all the samples individually and got VCFs for uh, any particular sample in your workflow, now we want to take advantage of the fact that uh, take advantage of the fact that you have multiple samples. So you don't have just a single sample you're calling on, you have multiple samples. And it's nice because it gives you more uh, power to determine uh, what are the artifacts in your data and what are not. And also, what is the uh, allele frequency? For example, if you have different exome kits and some kits do not have coverage at particular sites, you want to know whether, um, you want to know the allele frequency, so you need to figure out whether you are not able to call a variant because there was no data, so uh, you just did not see any reads and you have no idea what happened there, or whether you didn't, did not call a variant because there was no variant, right? Uh, so you want to aggregate as much information as possible to update your likelihood of your genotypes um, and possibly uh, filter out variants that you not, do not believe. Uh, and you can also include uh, like family information, which we do in uh, genotype refinement to uh, update your likelihoods based on population priors and family uh, information. So the kind of basic idea uh, of why having multiple samples helps you to call variants is summarized here. So suppose you have a, suppose you just have a single sample, the one on top, and it has pretty, pretty low coverage, and you, you got like a few reads that uh, support, support your, uh, your variant, but you're not quite sure whether uh, it's some sort of bias. Maybe it's a strand bias and all of the bases on one strand of that position are turned out to be Gs. Um, however, if you have multiple samples and you can see uh, that across all the samples, the allele fraction is actually uh, gives you a better sense that the variant in the sample A is true. Uh, so having uh, basically having more samples give you gives you more more more, more power more information about this particular site uh, and allows you to update your likelihood accordingly. Um, so as I mentioned previously, one thing you could look at is you can now that you have more than one sample, you can look at any particular sites across all samples and see if there's any evidence of uh, strand bias or uh, allele bias. And instead of having just one sample to go on, you have 50,000 samples and then you can be like very sure that something is happening. Uh, so you can use that information to filter out the sites that are, that are, that are not good. Um, and also, as I mentioned previously, it helps with um, joint analysis and this differentiation between two different situations, between the situation where you do not have a variant, but you do have a data, or you have no data, so you do not know whether you have a variant. So the idea is that we want to uh, somehow indicate the difference in your output between those two situations. And we do that by summarizing the, uh, uh, the, all the 
possible sites in your VCF. And if you have a variant, sorry, if you do not have a variant because it's a situation on top, we will emit a home ref call for, for that site. And if it's a situation on the bottom, you will emit no call. And so this will help you sort of uh, get a better estimate <coughs> of the allele frequency and things like that. Um, so in terms of the actual, the actual pipeline, the, the way we do that is in uh, two different steps. So first, we, uh, we run the haplotype caller, the tool that Geraldine described in the last talk, and we, in, and we run it in, in, with a special uh, command line option, which outputs the genomic VCF which is a VCF that includes all possible information about all possible um, <coughs> sites. And then once we had that genomic VCF, once we have all, all genomic VCFs for all samples, we will aggregate in, it into a single entity, whether that's just a big VCF or a database, as we'll see later. Uh, and then we can run genotype GVCF tool to uh, jointly genotype samples, which will, uh, which has slightly different math from the one in haplotype caller, and which basically takes use of uh, the fact that we have multiple samples to update your likelihood, likelihoods of your gen genotypes. Um, so here is a little snippet of what uh, genomic VCF looks like. Uh, the basic idea is that we add an extra alternative allele, which is called non-ref, which represents the absence of <coughs> variant. And since we add an alternative allele, we also have to uh, add the additional DLs for that allele. So this is in the yellow is an example of site where we have a variant. So we still add a non-ref allele here, and so we have to calculate the PLs, and now instead of uh, three values, we have six values, right? And for the positions where uh, there's no variant, we, we only have the non-ref allele, and we output PLs, our, uh, our uh, beliefs that at this particular site, there's no allele. There's no variant. Um, and we want to do that because uh, we want to, when we have, when we're gonna jointly genotype our samples, we want to be, want, want to know whether at this particular site in this sample, whether how confident we are that there was no variant, variant right? Because maybe like there's, there's a chance that there was a variant, so we want to have a sense of that. So we actually estimate that information. It's not a, the exact uh, computation that that haplotype caller does, but it's some kind of some kind of heuristic. Um, and the overall structure of the VCF. So GVCF is basically it's it, it's it's a valid VCF. It, it it conforms to the standard of the VCF. However, it uh, as a said it adds these non-variant non variant sites. Uh, whereas in the regular VCF you have a header and then you have a uh, one line for each variant. In the GVCF you're gonna have a header and then you will have uh, these blocks because we don't want, well we don't want to store usually a site for each position for each loci for each base pair. We wanna aggregate them together because there's not much information uh, in any, like storing in this particular size. These don't vary so much, right? Most of them will be pretty much the same. We want to aggregate in, 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 in one big block. Uh, so we do that, so we have a variant, then non-variant block, then variant record, then non-variant block, and so on. And, uh, and if you want to be 
more precise, you can add this extra command line option and that will output um, a, re uh, a line for each, for actual each site. So this is the basic, the basic structure of GVCF, if you ever uh, open it in, uh, open it up in the text editor. Hmm? What's the difference for the GVC for Exxon and for the ordinary? Uh, that's a good question. Oh yes, yeah. so yeah, so that's the idea that that in the the fact that there was no records will be represented in this box. So it will still output information about all sites, but you will know whether there was no coverage at some at particular sites in the whole egg zone where you did not have baits, right? But you, but yeah, you will have records for all possible, uh, for all sites in your, in your genome. So for this state, the targeted region might be used for the exome region might be used for this. No, they will not be. But the fact that you will not, you don't have uh, baits there, you don't have coverage there will be represented in, in, in this ECF. Um, so you generate a bunch of these GVCS for each sample, and then you call, uh, and then you join call them to get together, and finally uh, you get one big VCF, and all the non-ref fields are gone, as you can see. And it will have one genotype field for all of your samples with updated PLs. Um, yeah. So this is the final output of, of, of the pipeline. In terms of the uh, command lines, uh, so the command line uh, from GTK3 was combined GVCFs where you, uh, you generate a bunch of GVCFs uh, using haplotype caller, and then you call combined GVCFs uh, on the list of those GVCFs and it will give you one big file. However, the problem is it's not super scalable because indexing in this file is hard and you wanna be, be able to index really fast across the uh, entries of that big table. So Intel came out with a solution for us, which is uh, Genomics DB, which is a database uh, that stores the same exact information. However, the indexing is super fast, which so it's actually is a scalable solution. And so uh, this still is still a part of uh, GTK4 and you can use it. And if you have a small cohort of samples, it, it's still fine. However, if you have more than a few hundred samples, then this is a preferred solution. Uh, and since at the broad we're calling like hundreds, tens of thousands, hundred thousand samples in the Nomad, uh, we had to develop that to actually, to just be able to do anything useful. Uh, here are the command, command lines. Um, so yeah, you, this is all combined GVCFs, produces one big uh, table, and here you specify a path to the database instead. Um, yeah, so this is what I mentioned before. Uh, and finally, now that you have that output of either, either one of the tools, either the uh, combined GVCFs or the genomics DB uh, database, you input that, that will serve as input to genotype GVCFs, which will output your final, final result. Um, 
so the qual score score that that's output in the haplotype caller also gets updated based on uh, uh, based on the PLs of the uh, of other samples across the site and um, another useful feature of uh, join calling is that so as we uh, as we will talk later today uh, we haplotype caller is very permissive so we are striving to achieve good sensitivity so we kind of we we want to call a variant uh, even if we're not quite sure it's a variant and filter it out later uh, other than uh, not call it and then, well, not being, it's, it's, we're striving to achieve better sensitivity and then as a second step, we're gonna filter to achieve a specificity. That's kind of the paradigm. So the way we filter is, uh, well, in the VQSR, for example, we use multiple annotations uh, for filtering and with joint calling, what it does for our notations is that it actually kind of shrinks the distribution a little bit. So you don't have as wide variance in our notation space. And so it allows us to, uh, to filter things much easier, much more easily. Uh, and here's some results for uh, showing, well, basically we wanna show that the, 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 this paradigm of joint calling does not reduce our sensitivity or specificity. And this is, uh, uh, this is a result for kind of the overall um, cohort. And uh, we show that it actually helps us uh, up to some point, up to a point about 600 samples, and then we saturate and we don't actually see much increase, but it doesn't really, uh, doesn't hurt us. Uh, and as well, it does not hurt us for variants that are very rare. For example, for singletons, variants that occur only one in your entire population. The, uh, the, the, the finding of those variants is not, is not impacted by using joint calling. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. So this is a plot. So let's look at this plot. This is plot of sensitivity of SNPs uh, for two different samples. And on the X axis, you have the number of samples in your cohort. So as we increase the number of samples from zero to like a hundred to a uh, thousand, you see the increase from sensitivity of finding SNPs. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, how many, how many true positive we found over, uh, from the overall number of SNPs that we called. And it rises from about like 0 0.8 to, uh, yeah, 0 0.85 like to uh, 0 0.9. Uh, this is sensitive, sensitivity for indels, um, and the red, the red, the red dots and the uh, blue dots are two different, two different samples, and we also uh, include two different kits in this analysis. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean the well, right. It's it's one sample, but it was sequenced using different different uh, different technologies. And we have the same cohort sequenced in two different cohorts, and then depending on the number of uh, examples we test, we call it the sensitivity. Right. Yes. Yeah. So for for a precision, the indels actually decrease a little bit when samples. Increase. Yeah, so one, uh, 
I guess uh, one small thing to consider is that once you start mixing together different platforms uh, that could impact things a little bit. So it does not necessarily mean that in any particular of the samples, uh, we got less uh, precision, but once we start adding samples that are uh, sequenced using different capture kits, then we see the drop of precision. Um, and the sort of take home message for scalability of the GDK4 pipeline is that uh, so the reason why the whole genomics DB was developed is because we run into the problem that we just could not call the increasing number of samples. And th this is a, a outdated slides, slide and we were trying to call a few thousand of WGS and it was taking weeks. And the, with genomics DB, that process got scaled, uh, well, magnitude times larger so back in the day it was it was like five times uh three times faster and we actually uh were able to do sixty thousand whole genomes now it's 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 more than hundred thousand um so basically all i know that it's uh it's a it's a database solution that is specifically designed for uh storing vcf information and it allows for indexing across uh, across rows of tasks, I believe. So, which is not which you cannot do with like a regular file. You cannot you can just look up certain things in genomics to be really fast, and that's why it gives you that speed up. And you'll have the opportunity to actually work with it uh, after the break in the practical. You generate one when you look at how it's structured and so on. It was something that was developed specifically for this use case by uh, collaborators at Intel um, who were helping us kind of figure out how to scale up to the next level at the time. Right? Um, yeah, this is it. Are there any questions? Coffee break? Thank you.